Welcome to With You Every Step, the solo travel podcast that explores, explains and hopefully inspires you to travel the world by yourself. I'm your host, Michelle Lee. Welcome to With You Every Step. Today's guest is Jared Byrne. Now, you might know Jared from Dancing with the Stars or seeing him on TV with Dirty Dancing, Immersive Cinema. Today, we're going to talk to Jared all about dancing around the world. He is a professional ballroom dancer. Welcome, Jared. How are you today? I'm great. Good to see you. I know. So good to see you too. So for those that don't know, well, actually, no one will know because I haven't released this on my podcast. Jared and I actually met on Dirty Dancing, which I was a part of. Yeah, it was an incredible production. I was so happy to be a part of it. The response from it's been amazing too. Yeah, it was great. So for those that don't know, it was immersive cinema, which means that people get immersed into the world of Dirty Dancing, which has never been done in Australia in this way before. No, the first time and it was such a huge scale in, in which they approached this and rebuilt Kellerman's Resort, which was just so amazing to see and to see the audience respond to it the way they did was uh, remarkable. Mm, and you might actually know Jared from Dancing with the Stars, which has just wrapped, hasn't it, Jared? It has. I'm so relieved. I love the show, but I'm exhausted. I, I pretty much call myself a glittery camel because I just carry people for the whole show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are a professional dancer. I am, yes. And you have travelled the world dancing. I have, yeah. It's been 24 years that I've been dancing and uh, it's taken me all around the world and pretty much throughout Asia. Okay, so do you remember the first time that you went to a competition? Is it a competition? Is that what you call it? Yeah, so uh, in Borum dancing, the, the biggest thing for us is competition. So we, we start off local, grew up in Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. So I, I started at the Kyamba Smith Hall. It's this tiny little place and this beautiful venue that I did my first competition in. Some black pants, some riding boots and a little bow tie. I was cute. I had an <laughs> afro. It was it was amazing. And I just got addicted to the, the sport, to learning, to performing and uh, luckily that's taken me then to cities and then obviously overseas. So my first uh, trip overseas was when I was 19 and it was to Japan. It was actually called the Asian Tour. So it was the first time they did it and it took us to eight different countries or and, and capital cities of those countries in the space of two and a half weeks. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. How many competitions did you have in that time? Eight. We, we did a competition in each of those cities. So first up was Japan, and, and so we we're performing in Tokyo. So we had four days there, two days lead up, and then a, a day just after the competition. And it was my first experience of being in an international country, and I had no idea what to expect. Growing up in Wagga Wagga, I wasn't really exposed to much diversity. So going overseas uh, and to Japan was mind-blowing. From an accent point of view, I knew nothing. I didn't have any ability to speak another language. Japanese was so far from what I could do. And you sort of go to these countries believing that you can speak or understand or they may speak a little English. No one spoke English there. We had to have a translator with us all the time because there's no way we could have gotten around. So my first memory there, we arrived at 6 p.m. at night. There was nothing open except McDonald's, but we saw this one little Japanese uh place that was selling sushi and waved in try to signal how do I how do I get into this place and they said to come in walk straight in hit my head on the door frame <laughs> I, I'm six foot one and this door frame is probably maybe five eight so I, I don't think anyone usually has a problem with it over there but I walked straight into that door how old were you at this point I was 19 yeah so it was an eye-opening experience for me but it, it changed the fabric of my career because I, I just wanted to travel more I wanted to see more and also being exposed to dancing in that international scale that the level is so high and, and the way they train throughout Asia and throughout sort of uh, the US and London which I've been to as well is way more intense than what we could do uh, they, they live and breathe it so it, it taught me a lot about the work ethic the dedication and, and also that I actually had the ability to to succeed over there. Now, I don't know much about dancing competitions at all. Yep. So this is why you're here, because you're teaching me. Now, I want to know, did you go by yourself or is it a team? No, so in Borum Dancing, we, we obviously have a dance partner. So my partner at that time was Sky Wilson. 
we traveled together. So, so we, just the two of you? Just the two of us. So okay. we were traveling together. Sometimes you'll, you'll travel with a team or some people from your studio. But in this case, it was just us. So it was one lonely Australian couple traveling with people from all around the world. And in, in Asia, ballroom dancing is huge. There's a, there was a million registered dancers in China alone. Wow. Just I ballroom did dancing. not know yeah. that. They love it that much that they put a lot of money into it. So in this first Asian tour that they did, the prize money just for first place was $10,000. So if you won the eight competitions in two and a half weeks, you would have made, I think it would have been 90 grand because there was a few comps that were paying about 15000 Okay, so you split that between the two of you. Yeah. I obviously didn't win. Otherwise, I'd be in a very, very different position, but it attracted the best from around the world. So, But I, I did make some money. Okay, so do you remember how high you got? So I was dancing in the amateur ranks at that time. So there's there's two divisions. There's professional and there's amateur. Amateur tends to range from ages of 16 to about, well, you can go to 35, but once you get to about 25 and you, you're doing well, you turn pro and then there's obviously more money, more teaching, more exposure, more shows that you can do. In the amateur, they don't tend to pay, but this tour is so big that they were even paying the amateurs. So if you won one of the amateur competitions, you'd get about $2,000 per comp. So we didn't win that either. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. I, I wasn't very good back then. I, I did get third and fourth place. And from the eight competitions, maybe I made about $3,000 all up. So it wasn't too bad. Did you feel deflated from that? No, no. I, I was surrounded by the most incredible dancers. And just to see that I could match it on a little bit of their scale and, and uh, it just made me want to come back home and work even harder so I could go over there and, and do better. So did you have time to do any tourist things while you were there? It's always been so hard. It, every time I've traveled overseas, minus probably two trips, it's been for dancing. So I, I go over there and there's a sole purpose to do well. So we're not going over there to party and go crazy. But we do take two or three days any time we can to go see some touristic places. So when we're in Japan, it was at that cherry blossom time. So it was so beautiful to go over there and, and see the beautiful architecture there. But also these trees were just magnificent. But I was just obsessed with Tokyo. It's so clean. It's so organized. The train systems are amazing. So just to see that little pocket has made me want to travel back there again. So you haven't been back? I haven't been back yet. I've seen a lot of Asian countries. I've been back to a few of them a couple of times. And every time I go back, I try to see something new and be exposed to something different. So you have a dance partner with you the whole time. So that's two weeks, 24-7. Do you share a room together as well? Uh, yes. So at that time, my dance partner at that stage was my girlfriend as well. So that makes it easier. If it's not, then trying to work out the living situation but you end up becoming quite close and there tends to be a lot of gay men within ballroom dancing so they tend to sleep and share the same room but uh, my partner after that we weren't together so we'd have to organize different things or I'd make her sleep on the couch or outside or no that I'd, nice <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd, I'd always take the couch but you develop such a close bond and such a close friendship with your, your dance partner because you spend so much time and there tends to be a bit of fighting here and there. That was going to be my question. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it depends on the personalities. I'm not a fighter. I, I don't tend to yell because I'm always right. <laughs> That's not true. I'm <laughs> always wrong. So it takes a lot to develop that patience and, and to be that comfortable around each other because you're physically in connection all the time when you're dancing, when you're moving with each other. And because you're competing, it raises those stakes as well. So it's not just fun in, in creating movement together, but because you want to win, that a small step or a small thing out of place can mm. cost you either first or second sometimes. So a lot of the time, the, the tensions can raise pretty high between a partnership. So have you been traveling while you've had an argument with a partner and had to keep working with them? So I actually went to London for the international championships. And while I was over there, my girlfriend and I at the time broke up, but we were still were dancing competing, with? and that's who I was dancing with. We actually did better because oh. she danced with such aggression <laughs> and hatred for me that it, it obviously created a chemistry, and a chemistry which on the external seemed like tension and, and fire and passion, which was just her hating me because she had a broken heart. So, yeah. <laughs> but then you had to stay with her for how long did the competition go for after that? So we were there for another week after that. 
and we were staying in the same place and even when we traveled uh, back we were stopping via singapore on the way home and doing a competition there having lessons so we we traveled over there and it, it was it was very very difficult in in coming back and, and we were really close friends and also shared a business together so it threw my world upside down but from the competition side we did really well we we won in singapore and uh so i think i should just break up with my partners more when I'm dancing and I'll get good results. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That'll work. Lesson learned. Yeah. But thinking about when you're traveling with people, I often say it's like the make or break of a friendship, relationship, whatever it is, whoever you're traveling with. So if it is your dance partner, I can imagine it can be quite uncomfortable. But then, like you said, it gives you extra passion. Yes, it, it is volatile at times. And, and you're right, when you're traveling with someone, you're in each other's pockets all the time and unless you like the same food and like traveling in the same places. So I've been really lucky. I've, I've been able to travel with some amazing people and I, I, I just want to see everything. And, and one of the biggest things I, I like to do when I go to a country is run. I, I find uh, going in cabs or in public transport, I don't tend to see what I want to see. And I, I tend to find a lot of really cool places to eat or drink or sit down just because I run through the city because it's a really different perspective. So every time I get to a new country or a new city, I tend to go for a run in the morning and, and just find whatever I can find. And I end up down some really interesting back alleys that have this beautiful architecture or, or artwork or a, a little niche coffee place that you'd never know existed. Yeah, that's a really good idea. My last episode I was talking about that apparently I like gyms when I go traveling. I don't go to a gym now. But when I stay at a resort, I love the gym. Yeah. And I don't know why. I think it's just getting out and seeing something different and seeing new people. I'm not sure what it is, but I don't go to a gym here, but only when I'm traveling. Yeah. Oh, you, you do get motivated to, to get out and be, I suppose, find some level of fitness as well. And, and I spend a lot of time in hotels. So it, it gives you an opportunity to try to work off those calories you eat on the plane because the food's never good. So after that first Asian tour that you did. Yep. Where did you go next? So oh, on the Asian tour, we went to Japan. Then from there, we went to Taiwan. That was crazy. I've, I've never seen a more chaotic city in Tell Taipei. me about Taiwan. I don't know anything about it. I haven't spoken to anyone that's been there either. So I've been there twice. I went there last year as well. So I went on this Asian tour, which is back in 2008, and then went back there last year. And Taiwan is the most underrated, beautiful place I've been. If you step outside of Taipei, which is a chaotic Asian city, but outside of that, the the rainforest, the the beach, the cliffs, and all this incredible historic architecture in these little towns is truly breathtaking. And I went to I'm going to try to remember. I think it's Jiufen, which is J U I F E N, which is maybe about a 40 minute Uber or drive outside of Taipei, and it's towards the coastline. So from this little, it's like a mining town, but it's on on the cliff face, and it's overlooking this beautiful sort of blue water. But the the town has this long stretch road in between all these buildings and all the hanging lanterns, and the food there is amazing. And it's a big touristic place, but it's really really nice to see. So. That was a day that I had spare when I was there last time and, and Taiwan's magical. So it's definitely a holiday destination as well. Mm, okay. And how did you go in that competition? I did really well. I was better now. You should see his eyes light up right now. <laughs> yeah, we went over there. So I'm, I'm professional now. And, and so uh, going back there all those years later, we got fourth in, in the, the professional competition, which competing against the greatest dancers in the world so the, the three couples that beat us were actually in the top 12 of the world which is huge i i stepped away from competitive dancing for a, probably about six years uh, to do stage shows and tv and just for a bit of fun last year i decided to go back to competitive dancing just to learn and get better and push my body and taiwan was actually our first competition for my new dance partnership and it was so great it was going back with maturity I learned a lot, I learned a lot about myself and, and I just had so much fun and came away with a good result too. Yeah, maturity makes a massive difference, doesn't it? Yes, huge really difference, does. yeah. Yeah, with everything, with the way you travel. I remember when I first traveled the first time, 
I guess I thought things weren't as cool as what I would now. Yeah. I remember being in Croatia with my dad and we walked down one of the very big famous lakes and I remember just saying to dad, this is boring. <laughs> I'm, I'm so done. Where now I'm craving to go back there. So maturity makes a massive difference. Yeah, and I think the maturity slows you down as well in the way that you, you don't need a rush to to experience something beautiful that I, I just like peace and quiet. So I think a lot of the places I tend to find now have no people around me or people who don't know how to speak to me so I can just exist on my own and, and just see some beautiful sights and I tend to like a lot of nature because my life's in cities or is constantly busy so any way I can find a space to slow down and learn something new or see something new uh, is my favorite thing to do. Okay so after Taiwan yep, we went to Hong Kong and Macau and that was a chaotic day and a half it was pretty much a trip in and out of that country Macau was just filled with casinos and it was like a crazy Vegas. So it, it pretty much all casinos and it was exciting. I remember turning up to the, the fancy dinner, welcome dinner that they have for these dance competitions and they had ice sculptures, they had sushi, they had oysters flown in from Australia. It was epic. And to dress up black tie, when I say Asians love ballroom dancing, they go on another scale. So everything's like five course dinners and all of that. So we're the entertainment and people pay a lot of money to come and watch us as the entertainment for these competitions. And then from there we went to South Korea, which was probably one of my favorite places I've been. It, it was just so calm, so beautiful. And it started snowing there as well when we were there, which was really, really nice because I'd never seen snow. And from there, then we went to... Malaysia, went to Kuala Lumpur. I've never been sicker in my life. Somewhere I picked up a bug and I, I saw the, the inside of a hotel room for two days and managed to come out and dance in this competition, sweating bullets and, and I, I wasn't feeling very good. But would have been quite weak, I'm sure. Very weak and mouth closed the whole time. <laughs> it's probably the easiest way to describe that. But pretty much I went from the hotel room onto the floor, ran back to the room, but I wasn't going there and not dancing, that's for sure. And then after that, went to Indonesia. We went to Jakarta and had a police escort. And I'll, that was the first time I saw a family of six on a motorbike. Oh. Yeah. yeah six just, people. Yeah. yeah. Who needs a car when you've got a motorbike? That's they right. just had the, the mum and dad and all the kids in between. It was, I, I've never seen anything like it. So, yeah, it, it's efficient though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I wouldn't trust myself with two kids on the back of my bike. So. Wouldn't happen in Australia. Not no, at all. No. <laughs> You'd be put in jail for yeah, it. Yeah, so. oh, well, definitely. <laughs> and then after that, we went to Singapore. That was beautiful, hot, humid, crazy. But it was a, a short trip there. But I, I really like Singapore and it tends to be a place I stop a lot of the time if I go to London or into in, any other Asian countries. So where you have the dance competitions, are they all the same temperature? Like they always have air con or heating inside? Generally speaking, yes. But I, I'm not really impacted by that because I grew up in the country where... We, we'd have a hall that didn't have air conditioning, so you just sweat it out. But most of the places, especially within the Asian countries, tended to have air-conditioned stadiums or hotels that have ballrooms. and So you're always generally comfortable. But I was in Malaysia last year in Penang, and it was so humid, and the competition had air conditioning, but it didn't matter. Like, I've never sweated so much in my life. So, yeah... The climates in Asia tend to be a bit challenging sometimes when you're competing. Yeah, I know when I played basketball in the US, we were doing a tournament when I was younger and one of the stadiums, they had ramped up the heat inside knowing that we don't have any heating in our stadiums here. And so none of us were coping. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a tactic that we got told that they did. So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, I don't ever remember. I had a few times where they might have had the aircon or the heating on the opposite way, but never as a tactic to ruin the competition. But maybe I'll start doing that in comps in Australia. I'll just <laughs> throw a few kangaroos out on the floor and, and, and eliminate the competition that way. <laughs> yeah, we thought it was really bizarre that they would want to do that to us. We were only teenagers. Did you lose though? I can't actually remember. <laughs> I think we might have. Yeah. And and of course, we blamed it on the fact yeah. that they did that to us, yeah. not the fact that we weren't as good. Yeah. <laughs> At that point, this is still all of the same tour, right? This is the same tour. So this was... This is all in two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. It was crazy. And we, we actually traveled... So there was a lot of international judges. So these are the best judges and coaches around the world that were all invited to judge here, which raised the profile of these events. 
and then there was international competitors that all came. So we all traveled in, in buses together. So the organizers of the competitions would pick us up from the airport and take us there. So we were like superstars or celebrities. And I was this 19-year-old kid who couldn't really dance that well. Like I was okay, but I, I, I wasn't anything to, to write home about. And, and here I am being treated like a, a superstar. It felt pretty good. This was still in that amateur section. Yes, they hadn't really done any competitions like that uh, in Asia. And it was starting to become more and more popular. So this is over 10 years ago now, where now it's so stock standard for Australians to travel to these competitions. But this was the first time they'd ever done this Asian tour. And we're the only Aussie couple that did it. Yeah, we were treated very, very nicely. Did you have to pay to enter? So we had to pay to enter, uh, but they provided us free accommodation to be there and then prize money if we did well and we did well enough that every comp would take money that justified our expenses there so the trip cost us nothing wow yeah that's pretty amazing it's really really good does this competition still run so these these comps still do run the asian tour still happens and we we did some competitions last year not in this asian tour but in taiwan and malaysia and both competitions gave us money for flights and also our accommodation and then prize money if we did well which we did so we end up coming out ahead to do these competitions which is quite nice and so you just found this and entered no i'm kind of famous no (laughs) kidding kidding (laughs) at 19 when you could barely dance yeah Mm -hmm. yeah no these days the girl i'm dancing with her name's alana donovan and she's an ex black ball champion, which in Borum dancing is like winning the world championships. And so she's got a, a, a great name in competitive Borum dancing. So for us to be dancing together, we now get invited to competitions, which is just such a, a great honor to be able to travel to a comp to, to compete and to be a part of it. And to as much as you're not going to make huge money out of that, where the money comes for Borum dancers is more in the teaching. So if you're doing great internationally and quite high up then people will pay more money to come and learn off you so then after you finished your first tour Mm -hmm. and you were still in the amateur section yep what happened after that where did you go next after that we went to blackpool in london so it's such a random place to travel so blackpool's north of london i think it's from memory it's about six or seven hour drive and it's on the coast and it's where everyone in London on the long weekend in May goes to do their Bucks parties or party. It's the most bizarre thing you ever see. There's this beautiful place called the Winter Gardens in Blackpool. and it Bachelor party? Yeah, yeah. bachelor parties. Okay. So when when you go there, the, it's this... It's the biggest comp for ballroom dancing in the world and it's very prestigious to be there. So you've got the best ballroom dancers in the world. So you'll have 300 couples entering one event that you've got to try to get to the top six. It'll start at 300, go down to 160, down to 120, down to 80, down to 40, down to 24, 12 and 6. So, and this all happens over like a seven-day stretch. And that's just in one style. So you've got Latin, you've got ballroom, you've got the amateur, the youth, and the pros. So there, there's so many different levels and age groups there. And then all these incredible judges from around the world. Everyone's dressed up in these beautiful Gucci suits and looking fabulous. And then on the flip side, because it's the long weekend, you've got all these groups of Englishmen rocking up for their bucks parties and bachelor parties. and Which I think, they, do they call it stag over there? I think it is. May, maybe stag, stag parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and okay. it's just completely polar opposite worlds but it, it's so funny it, it's it's amazing so you've got a group of italians walking around and in amongst that will be just guys completely drunk so it's um <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool and was that still in the amateur section or was that professional at that point no so that was still in the amateur section so that was a year following this asian tour so this was in 2009 and went over there and did terrible. Yeah, we, we, we didn't even make it out of the first round. So that was probably the biggest eye-opening experience and really hit home that I needed to do some work on my dancing because in my small little country hometown and when I moved to Capital City, I was doing okay, did all right in competitions, went overseas and that doesn't mean anything. So uh, I had a lot of work to do and the experience of it and to be a part of that, to be surrounded by this incredible talent from all around the world and the the prestige of being in the Blackpool's Winter Garden with a live band, which is called the Empress Orchestra, 
is probably one of the highlights of of my competitive career and just seeing that and that was the catalyst that made me want to work harder that has provided me with all this uh, work and everything that's happened in the last few years. So at that point, you were still, I'm just trying to get my head around the fact that you were still not considered professional no. and you're doing all this traveling. Yes. Yeah, it's quite amazing really. So anyone can do this. You could enter the Blackpool Championships this year. So you don't have to qualify in yeah. any way for a lot of these comps and you won't do well at all. You'll you'll bomb out straight away. Yeah. But you could go there for the experience. There's a couple there from Asia that goes every year and they would be close to maybe 90 years old. <gasps> And they go out there and, and dance and uh, oh, dress up in a outrageous. Happy. Yeah, so people from all around the world go there for the experience of Blackpool. They obviously won't make it past the first round, but there's How do nothing... they go? Oh, not very good. <laughs> no, they're cute though. Yeah. yeah, I would go just to watch them. Yeah. <laughs> So anyone can enter. Mm. Anyone can enter. The The World Championships is different. Obviously, you'd have to be in the top two of your country to represent. But there is, yeah, the amateur ranks and then there's the professional ranks. Once upon a time, to be a teacher, you had to be pro. And the rules stipulated that you weren't allowed to classify yourself as a teacher and earn money as a teacher unless you were a professional. Because ballroom dancing is so expensive, they relax those rules so amateurs could teach. Then there's no real reason to turn pro now because... You can compete in amateur, which is actually more competitive in in the way that there's so many more competitors. In Australia, there's probably, say, close to 50 top Latin couples that will compete, where in the pro ranks, there's only about six. So you're better off staying in that because there's more events, there's more competition, there's a, a lot more energy on the floor, where in the pro... You can go out there and sometimes in Australia you dance by yourself or with two other people. So it's not as not as competitive and but overseas the pro is so much more competitive. Have you been in the world champion? I haven't ever competed at the worlds, but I'm Australia's world rep for this year's world championships, which I'm gonna to work towards. What does that mean? So I got second in the Australian Championships last year and that gives me the right to represent Australia at the World Championships, which is in Miami this year. So you're going to Miami? Going to Miami. I think there's a song about that. <laughs> was it Will Smith? I think it was Will Smith. Yeah. Cool. Have you been to Miami before? I have been to Miami and I hated it. Did you? I did. I didn't have much money and I didn't know anyone there. It's an intense place and it's like Gold Coast on steroids. Yeah, I loved it. I had some really fun times in Miami. But did you have friends? No, I travel by myself most of the time. I obviously experienced it in a very different way. Like I, I remember going down that main boulevard. I can't even remember what it's called, but just Ferrari after Ferrari and Lamborghini. There's so much money there. So mm. I did have fun, but not on the level of what I would. And I'd just come from Tampa. So I was living in Tampa. Chronologically, we're way out of sort of this order now. But I lived in Tampa for six months doing a show and I was like a superstar because I had an accent. I'd walk into a bar, say, can I have a beer? And everyone would swarm around me. Then get to Miami and no one cares. It was a different experience because no one would really pay me attention and I didn't have money, so no one would give me a drink. Did you stay in a hostel? I didn't. No, I didn't stay in a hostel. I had accommodation. So that I think that's, that's where I lost a, it. Yeah, that's a massive difference. I stayed at an amazing hostel. I've never stayed in a hostel in my life. No. Never. Never. Do, do you travel by yourself much? Yeah, but because these competitions always give us accommodation in hotels. So I've never actually stayed in a hostel in my life. Oh, okay. Hostels are the greatest, especially when you're by yourself. Yeah. And so you would have had a totally different experience in Miami because of that. I mean, everyone in a hostel is by themselves most of the time. Yeah. Now I think a lot of people go as friends or even sometimes couples go to hostels because they know that's kind of how you can meet other people and you can end up partying. And there's an amazing hostel in Miami that gives you free food. Oh, really? Uh-huh. It's included if you don't have any money. It's perfect. And then they had a pub crawl that I jumped onto, but I was a little intoxicated because I had a bottle of vodka that I had to finish before getting on a cruise the next day. Yep. And so I drank a little bit too much vodka. So then I just kind of put myself in the naughty corner and <laughs> didn't talk to anyone for a while <laughs> until I got my got myself back together because that can be quite bad for a woman being by herself. Yes. So I had to kind of get myself back together. But I still had an amazing night. <laughs> well, I'll have to do it that way. I'll probably remove the, the vodka from that story. But Yeah, yeah. You don't need that. Got to stay in a hostel at some stage. I'm, am I too old to stay in a hostel now? How old are you? 
32. No. No? No. I'm older than you and I still stay in hostels. Oh, perfect. Well, that's fine then. I, I, I don't know. I just always had this vision that it's like 20-year-olds going there and just playing card games and getting drunk, it which can, it probably is. Yeah, it can be, but there is also a lot of people. I shared a dorm with a woman that would have been definitely past her 60s. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's designed for solo travelers. Great. It's losing a little bit of a stigma where it is for young, crazy people, but they're still there. And yeah. it just, you choose to join in or not. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. All right, hostel travel now. I'm going to say no to all the accommodation <laughs> they provide me. I'll give it to someone else. <laughs> yeah, well, free accommodation though. And it, there's always these beautiful buffets at this free accommodation. So I just go there for the food. Yeah. And and I go there with a quite toned body and I always come back fat. Just because I, I can't, where, where do you stop with a buffet? I, I that That's probably the biggest question. What line do you draw? Do you keep eating? And, and I'm that guy always that will eat every cuisine there. I, I'll eat the Asian cuisine. I'll eat the Western cuisine. And then I'll take all those hot cross buns and everything else home that are there and the croissants. They're probably and, not hot cross buns. Or I actually just ate a hot cross bun. So <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> In my Easter special with Troy, we talk about hot cross buns and we're not sure if they have them all around the world. Do you know? I'm not sure. No. Yeah, maybe not. Know. Maybe it's just an Australian thing. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I, I think they've lost the stigma now as well because you can buy them in December. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can get them anytime. But Are you happy with that? Well, isn't it just raisin toast with like a cross on it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mind. It, it, I think that's fine. I don't think it needs to come out at Easter now. We'll yeah. just have them all year. That's what Troy said too. Troy's yeah. for all year round. <laughs> yeah. But is the, the cross... Like representing Christianity. I <laughs> <laughs> so, what makes this is <laughs> so funny is that I thought it was an X. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Troy, Troy laughed at me and said that I'm ridiculous because yes, the cross is from a religious meaning. Yes. <laughs> so it's quite funny that you just ask the same thing. <laughs> Well, I, I figured it would be something about Catholicism or Christianity. Yeah, I, I think that can be happily all year round. Or maybe just remove the cross for the rest of the year. Back on to your tour yes. around the world. Yep. Where else did you go? After Blackpool, we went back to London and then back home and decided to not spend money on traveling for a little while so I could get better at my dancing. And So you had to pay for all your flights? Yeah, we pay for everything. And so as an amateur, except for these Asian competitions, no one really provides prize money or anything in, in those amateur ranks. So you'll pay for flights, accommodation, and then when you're over there, you have to have lessons and generally lessons off some of the judges that you're going to be competing for because no one knows who you are. I always explain Borum dancing a bit like a, a new CD album that comes out. So you'll listen to it. The first time you listen to it, you may not like it. But then when you listen to it more and more and more, you'll you'll start to resonate with it, something new in that song, and then it becomes your favorite album. It's the same with the Borum couples. So sometimes you'll see them. And because you've got, say, 50 couples doing the same sort of thing on the floor, unless you know them or unless you've seen that dancing, say, 10, 15 times, you won't really resonate with it at the start. So you have to go over and have lessons and work with people so they can see what you can do. And then they might like your style. And... That's what you have to do when you go over there, and that costs money. You're spending money on flights, money on accommodation, and then money on these lessons, which the lessons are expensive. You will lose your mind. I had, just last year, I went to LA, and I was learning off a great coach over there who is 400 US for 45 minutes. Yeah, I mean, acting classes are pretty much just as expensive, yep. so I do understand. And you think, <gasps> but when you're working on your craft... Well, when they go to the toilet... Or they tell you a story about their childhood. It's like in that time. Yeah, sometimes. Oh. Yeah, they. Yeah, and or or they'll start telling you a story that relates to the step, which is five minutes long. That you've just looked at the clock, and it's cost you fifty dollars for a story that could have been summarized into one word. Do it, or whatever it's going to be. Like just fix it. Oh yeah, that hurts. It, it hurts a lot in the hip pocket and yeah. your head when you're watching the clock, and he's charging you that much that's right because it's your money they're making the money they don't mind making lots of money but hopefully i then win a world championship which allows me to charge that much <laughs> that's right yep. then you can charge people and tell stories yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i'll tell very slow long, long stories, stories. yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> You've already got the practice now. You know what to do. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's the lineage. It just keeps going in that way. And the lessons get shorter, more expensive, and the stories get longer. So you, sometimes you just walk out there not even sweating. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Have you had any problems while traveling? Communication, like probably when I went on that Asian tour, the translation of things was probably the hardest part because I didn't realize how big a language barrier was and any people that I'd sort of dealt with, whether I was living in Sydney that may be from a Chinese background or a Japanese background, generally had some form of English. But these days, there's probably a lot more English spoken and a lot more English taught in schools. But when, when I went back in 2008, I, I, I can't remember having many conversations. So you tend to just point and, and mumble and put on some weird accent that you think is actually going to help you get through. But that that was probably the biggest thing for us. I've never really had huge problems except when I went to the States for the first time. It wasn't long after September 11 and I had a shaved head and a really big beard back then. And they were stopping everyone and it felt really uncomfortable and, and it was really difficult trying to get through customs. And so that was probably the only time I had a real problem. Otherwise, I, I, I generally sort of go through scot-free and I've never really been lost or lost money or been robbed. So thankfully, that none of that happens. But maybe once I start going into hostels, who knows, I'll, I'll drink a bottle of vodka and then I'll have some problems. No, <laughs> hostels are the best. The biggest problem I've had, which was in Dominican Republic, and that was at a five-star resort. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've stayed in all these hostels and never had an issue. Yeah. Staying in hostels has actually been safer for me. Yeah. I can't wait to travel. And I think the thing for me uh, as a dancer, because I always had this dream of being on stage, being on TV and being successful at my craft, that I, I sacrificed a lot of the party and, and the fun elements of travel for trying to find that success and trying to achieve something. So travel's always been really interesting for me. And I can't wait for the time when I travel just for joy and travel just to experience and learn. And my, my dream of travel is actually to go to South America for like six months or a year immerse myself in the language but also the language of the music and dance and it's so culturally intertwined there that i'm so passionate about latin american dancing salsa argentine tango that i i want to go to south america but i I can't justify going there for two weeks I, i have to go for six months or a year and i'm getting to the point where I'm reaching a, a, a great point in my career and what I'm doing. And it's really hard to sort of just hang up the boots for a year and disappear. So I'm always torn because early on I couldn't travel for fun and freedom because I had a job to do because I wanted to achieve something. Now I've achieved it. I, I want to keep going more. So I'm going to have to cut the ties there at some stage and disappear for six months just to You could do three months. I do three months trips and three months is a good time. Because it still gives you enough time to get into it all and relax and enjoy and be part of it. But then it's not long enough that you lose everything that you have at home. Yeah. Being work or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, three months it is. Three months it is. I'm going to go tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) I wish. I wish more than anything. (laughs) Yeah, you've been pretty busy, haven't you? I have been busy. I've just started a new production today, Melbourne Theatre Company, which is really exciting. And first time I'm choreographing for them. So can't wait to to sink my teeth into that so you've moved in now to i never say that word how do you say choreography yes can you try it again please say it (laughs) choreography yeah did i say it yeah that was stressful though i didn't (laughs) know what was gonna happen (laughs) it was stressful okay so now you've moved into choreography yep i have yeah with dancing with the stars it, it taught me a lot about how to create for stage and tv and i had the pleasure of choreographing a few shows in the the last couple of years One I assisted on, which was called The Unbelievables, which was at the Opera House and travelled to Perth and and also the Arts Centre. And that was a a variety show that intertwined dance and remarkable acts like magicians and aerialists and a ventriloquist and singers. And so it was like an old school talent quest, but with the best performers from around the world. And then this year I, I got the opportunity to choreograph for the immersive cinema Dirty Dancing. And then now I'm, I'm getting more and more choreography jobs, which is just awesome. Like I, I've always loved dancing, but I also want to transition into producing and choreography because I want a long career in this, in this world. Would you be happy to not dance again or you want both? I'll dance forever. I, I think I've got a good five to eight years of physical full-on dancing left in me, but it is tiring and, and I'll never stop wanting to dance because when I choreograph, I want to teach. And when I, I teach, I want to 
be able to do whether it's the guys or girls part to a, a standard in which I expect them to do it. So with Dirty Dancing that we recently did, I didn't want people to do a step that I couldn't do. So if I could perform it, then I could justify that they should be able to do it. Minus some flips and kicking myself in the head. But within reason, uh, in most cases, I, I can dance that whole show back to front, whether as a guy or a girl. It was amazing. And it's definitely probably the best dancing that I've witnessed in Yay! person. Yay! Oh, it was phenomenal. And everyone that witnessed it, uh, that guests that came to Dirty Dancing, have all said the same thing. Yeah, that it's, it, it's mind-blowing what you created. I was very, very... I, I was just blown away by the response from everyone from it. And I, I think that the easiest thing I, I found to explain it was because I, I didn't come through the normal lineage of going to music theatre full-time school and, and going through the sort of same learning patterns that everyone did allowed me to create a show that was different to what most people had seen because I, I never thought of it in the same way of staging. So it allowed me to be quite ambitious and, and I had an incredible director, Tam, who gave me so much freedom, more freedom than you could possibly imagine. She basically didn't talk to me the whole time. So, but with, with that trust... That's her strength. She gives it to her actors as well and yeah. that's what I love about her. She's like, I trust you, do beautiful work so just create and then you know obviously she directs and gives us things that we need but she gives us a lot of freedom too yeah i, I was blown away by her ability to to trust in what i could do without her even really knowing me and she must have just seen something in me that had the ability and i, I was lucky enough for it to all work and, and happen in that way so i was really really proud with it when you're creating, do you want to actually dance? Like, how did you go with Dirty Dancing? Did you want to be up there on that stage as well? More than anything. Yeah, yeah it, it, it killed me because I realized when I started choreographing it back in December because I wanted to have it all ready to go because I was doing Dancing with the Stars at the same time that I wanted to make sure on the first day of rehearsals that the whole show was choreographed and filmed. So if I wasn't available, that my assistant Kyla was able to teach that show and continue the choreography with it. We we worked on that, but when we choreographed it, we marked most of the, the choreography. So we, we did all the shapes and all the spacing, everything else, but I actually never danced it full out. And it was the, the Melbourne rehearsal week that we had everyone in and we were dancing. And I realized that I actually hadn't danced it full out yet. And we are performing and, and sort of teaching the, the couples what to do and I, I decided to, to start dancing it full out and I remember Kyla's face freaking out because I'd never danced with her at my level and she's a commercial dancer, she's not a ballroom dancer so it was the most fun thing because I just threw her around and went crazy and that was what was so hard about watching the show because it's a show that I'd, I'd want to be in. It was exhausting so I don't want the exhaustion part of it but it was so much fun. An amazing way I travel now is a thing called Pro-Am. So, quick as explanation, and, and for a lot of women, it's really hard to find a male who will dance with them, do competitions, train every day, because it's like trying to find a husband and, or a, a really good boyfriend that you want to travel with. And, and that's really hard. And it is really hard. <laughs> that, just, just that. It's actually harder than finding a husband, because you've got to find someone that you like spending time with. And them being attractive is really beneficial, because it's a visual art form, and them having the ability to dance having money to justify spending towards travel. So a lot of times now that women will do a thing called prime where they actually pay their dance teacher for lessons and generally their male dance teacher, but then they'll pay them to do competitions. So there's competitions for pro-am where they're local in cities and also internationally. And it's now becoming such a big sport that there's prize money and there's a whole lot of travel involved. So I've got students who will now want to compete in say Singapore and so they will pay for me to come over there and compete with them. So and they so pay for all your travel? Yeah, they'll pay for the travel, accommodation and then also the time allocated for that dance competition and it's becoming a, a huge industry because from a time point of view and also they're already having dance lessons so then for us to dance with them in these competitions is really helpful and also we're not going to stuff up. Like we're, we're pros, so they're not going to worry about mm -hmm. dancing with an amateur. Or and, and for women, a lot of the time, they, because they have this ability to ha learn these, learn off great teachers, when they find a, a good male partner, a lot of the time the, the partners are only beginners. So the time it takes to build them up to be a, a good level for them to travel with. So now they just cut out the middleman and basically just go straight to a pro. And in, in the Asian market, 
they're they're quite competitive in the way that they want the best partner just like they want the best car or the best handbag whatever it might be and it's gotten to the point now where a lot of them will barter or bid for the best dancer and it, it, it and it's actually same as sydney house prices it's pushed up a lot of people's prices so wow. it's um it, it's become a, a, a huge crazy industry where there's a lot of competitive people and that now uh enables me to travel and and there's uh blackpool what, which i was explaining before uh-huh. has introduced pro-am dancing so now everyone has the opportunity to travel over there and and dance with their dance teacher in the winter gardens which has never been around until probably two years ago wow so then you can just now travel and no you don't have to pay for it yep exactly if you win Mm -hmm. there's competition money uh not so much for pro-am there's no there's no financial benefit for the student in in winning a pro-am comp except the prestige of winning that comp and and now because it's becoming quite p- competitive, so you'll have some teachers who are the top dancers in the world dancing with these students. So, like they they've got the opportunity to win with these great teachers. So and to be thrown around the floor by a, a great teacher or dancer is is pretty fun. Yeah, it's it's a crazy new industry that there's a lot of travel involved with. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's really amazing. It, it it's opened up a whole lot of uh, opportunities and doors for not only travel but teaching and and everything else. I, I I enjoy it, so I'm getting back into this after this show. Because I'm thinking, if there's if there's not money in it, yeah, why are they doing it? Yeah, multitude of reasons. So some people do it because they love dancing and they love learning. But what do you then work towards? Then they want to do a competition. Well, if they can't find a partner, who do you do a competition with? Other people may be single, and and so they're looking for that connection. Other people are just super competitive and want to win. Some will do normal competitions but then want to win other ones in pro ams And then other people do it for more negative reasons, whether they've come out of divorce or a breakup and it's something that helps re- repair them or they find something in themselves from doing that. And confidence. And, and the way I teach is I, I really try to build confidence and, and build that belief in, in themselves. And, and the aim for me is for my students to actually find partners and, and get them to a level where hopefully they can get a great partner that they can continue to travel and, and learn from. Mm-hmm. I get paid to do what I love, whichever form it is, whether it's performing, whether it's choreography, whether it's teaching, or whether it's doing competitions. I'll never complain a single day. We are approaching our destination. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts for the final five. Your favourite city or town? Oh, it's a tricky one. I'm going to say Tokyo is my favourite city. Okay. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was exciting. It was the first international city I'd been to and the food was incredible. Weirdest food you've ever eaten? I had a soup, sort of like a broth-like soup in South Korea and I remember trying to distinguish what was in it because it said beef, sort of the way it was written down. And after speaking with the waitress who couldn't understand a single word I, I was saying, she made this signal on her, her stomach, sort of like drawing little shapes. And so I, I realized that it was all the, the off guts of uh, a cow. So it was a cow intestine and blood soup. Mm. Yeah, so it had... Did you like it? It was actually delicious. But the, the next couple of days after it didn't quite agree with me. So, But yeah, it, it was a beautiful soup. That would be the last time I'll try intestines in mm. my soup. Okay. You haven't had testicles? I haven't had testicles, no. Okay. No, o- often people say testicles. It's very common. Yeah, I, I, I'm not excited for that. <laughs> I, I, I don't, don't see it as something I'm really looking forward to, to eating. So I, I'll generally stay away from offal. Yeah, I'm not an offal person at all. Beaches or mountains? beaches i was actually born in bondi and so i'm obsessed with beaches i'd say my favorite beach i've seen would be i'm gonna have to say malibu is pretty special nothing compares to to bondi or australian beaches so it's really hard to to find a good comparison till you get to the bahamas bahamas are pretty amazing i've heard that I, i haven't been there yet but hopefully when i go to miami this year then i can find a little way to sneak over that way but yeah i'd say yeah, probably Malibu just for the fun that I had at Nobu and all the restaurants around there and then the beach afterwards. But otherwise, Fiji and Vanuatu are pretty beautiful places to see. Mm-hmm. A tourist site that you can recommend is a must-see. I think 
what I said earlier, Zhifen in in Taiwan is such a beautiful place, and and the people, the food, and and also the view from that that mountainscape is is truly amazing. Can you say thank you in another language? Uh, merci or uh, Shishi. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been wonderful talking to you and hearing all about dancing all around the world. Yeah, I, I, it's been so much fun to talk to you. And hopefully next time we catch up, I might have a, a few more countries that I've visited and maybe three months in a hostel somewhere in South America drinking <laughs> vodka. That'd be great. I'll yeah. get you back on. You can tell us all about it. Yeah, can't wait. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to With You Every Step, hosted by Michelle Lee. We do hope you enjoyed listening. And if you did, make sure you tell everybody. If you didn't, nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Please subscribe to get up to date with our latest releases and give us a thumbs up on our social media at With You Every Step. We love to hear from you. If you have any questions or inquiries, head to the Contact Us page at our website, michellelee.com. That's also where you'll find all our blogs mentioned in the podcast. We love to hear from you and if we have inspired you to travel. Thanks for listening. Love life and adventure on.